All right, it's 7.02. I'd like to call the meeting to order. If everyone would still uh, please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> All board members are in attendance tonight. Uh, before we move forward with the approval of the agenda, um, is, is there any announcements from the board? Yes, I, I'd just like to talk. Uh, recently, our Erie County Association of School Boards has had some meetings, uh, along with uh, our district and board members have met with our legislators, Senator Rath and Assemblyman Norris. And uh, some of the things we talked about, as you know, this is a state budget session, and we're concerned with some of the uh, things that the governor has recommended. So I'll just tell you a few things, uh, and there's many, but I'll just highlight a few. Uh, we asked to reject the executive proposal to consolidate and eliminate expense-based categorical aid. Uh, support, we support legislative proposals to use federal funding to supplement, not supplant state aid. And uh, we support legislative proposals to increase the undesignated fund balance limit above 4%. And I'd just like to let the board know that today we did get an email from the New York State uh, School Boards Association, and in there is a letter um, that's very easy to fill out. It's already written. It goes directly to your senator and assemblyman, and there's about 15 things that talks about what we should do. So I would encourage everyone to take a few minutes and do that. Thank you, Dennis. Dennis, the one thing that you didn't mention is on the call with um, Senator Rath and um, Assemblyman Norris, we did ask that they look into the three feet Erie County distancing issue. Okay. Um, I did attend a diversity in the workplace a webinar that was very informative, talked a lot about hiring practices and mission and vision and how important um, it is to have diversity in the workplace. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that down the road. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, before uh, moving forward with the approval of the agenda in front of us, uh, based on a discussion beforehand, I would um, ask that we entertain a addition at the end instead of um, adjourning our regular board meeting uh, at the conclusion that we would exert, uh, adjourn to executive session for discussions of legal matters. With that as a proposed change, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Dawn, second. Do, all those in favor? Aye. 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 That Aye. carries. Okay. In our packet, we have uh, minutes to approve from our regularly uh, scheduled board meeting and executive session on February 22nd, as well as a special board meeting and executive session held on March, March 4th. Is there any questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve? I'm a uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries. Okay. Uh, for the correspondence, just like to note uh, for the record, uh, we received uh, 10 <clears throat> emails over the course of the last month, uh, four uh, concerning uh, the disparity between the music and arts program and the athletic program regarding uh, opportunities to participate uh, with with and without masks, distance, and so forth. There were five communications uh, concerning support for uh, a swift reopening of the schools, and there was one advocating for additional mental health staff. I know no unfinished business. Seeing none, Dr. Hicks, I turn it over to you for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Fuchs. Um, got two pieces for the superintendent's report tonight. The first is on new CDC guidance that was promulgated on Friday of last week. We want to discuss it a little bit. I sent a letter home to parents over the weekend uh, that described it, and then we'll get into our most recent budget draft. So uh, the CDC guidance was good news for those of us who are uh, looking to make sure that we can get kids back into school full-time, uh, full-day programs. Uh, the CDC guidance was divided between elementary, middle, and high school. At the elementary school, the CDC guidance, the new guidance, took the uh, proximity distance from six foot to three foot in the classroom, 
and it was regardless of the transmission zone that the that the school district happened to be in. At the middle school and the high school, there are four zones of transmission. Blue is the smallest transmission, yellow the next largest, orange the next largest, and then red the largest. The actual um, zones are defined by the number of the number of uh, cases that are transmitted based on every 100,000 uh, every 100,000 people in a particular area. At the middle and high school, if schools were in a blue or yellow zone, then three feet distance between kids in a classroom was the guidance. If schools were in an orange zone, it was still three feet of distance, but cohorts were recommended. And again, we do cohorts at our elementary and our middle school. Uh, I don't know of any high school that does cohorts in New York State. If the school was in a red zone, then it was six feet unless cohorts were used, in which case it could be three feet. So this guidance came out on Friday. It included two other things. First, the CDC for the first time removed the recommendations for the use of barriers. Second, the CDC, and this has been in existence at the CDC and something that New York State has not necessarily done, but the guidance recommended testing kids one time per week uh, in any zone other than blue with a random sampling of 10% of the stu students in a pool sampling. We have tested before when we were in an orange designation for New York State. We have the ability to test. We've been designated as a uh, limited service laboratory and we can test. We would have to order a bunch more tests in order to follow this particular guideline if it is adopted by the New York State Department of Health. So again, there's many other things in the guidance for, that the uh, CDC put out. Some of the language in the guidance was existing language that has been there since last summer. Some of it, like this physical proximity language, was brand new. New York State Department of Health has yet to adopt the CDC recommendations. It's our hope that they do. But the New York State Department of Health sets the rules and regulations for safety and health issues in schools across New York State. And as of today, and the governor had two press conferences today, one of which he was specifically asked about this, as of today, the New York State Department of Health doesn't have any information out on whether or not they're going to adopt the CDC guidelines. We hope that they will. In that case, as it stands right now, we would be able to bring our elementary, middle, and middle school kids back full time, full day. Uh, we would not because we are in a red zone, be able to bring the high school kids back full day. On the CDC website, there's a calculator for transmission rate, for community transmission rate. This is what New York State looked like as of this morning when I went on. Uh, most of the state is in a red zone. Some areas are in an orange zone. There's one lucky county that's in a yellow zone. Uh, Erie County, as you can see, is in a red zone. This is the calculation for Erie County. This, this calculator also exists on the CDC website. All you have to do is put in New York, Erie County, and it provides the seven-day rolling average. Unfortunately, the seven-day rolling average is up for transmission in Erie County, and it is at 218.9 per every 100,000 residents of the county. That number would have to be 100 or below in order to come out of the red zone as it stands right now with the CDC guidance. We have been planning to bring kids back full time at all the levels, elementary, middle, and high school for the past three and a half weeks. Uh, we've overcome many obstacles. We have a plan in place that we will share with parents next week for all of these particular variables when we bring kids to, in order to bring kids back. Our plan is to continue working towards making sure that we can get all the kids back here full time, full day, and solving all of the problems that exist around these particular areas, giving all of that information to parents at some point next week, probably Thursday, 
then conducting another survey that will ask three, that will really ask two questions. Um, the preference about full-time learning or fully remote learning and whether or not parents are able to transport students still uh, given that they would be for a full day rather than a half a day at the elementary or a hybrid model at the middle school and the high school. So that's where things stand as of now. We're waiting for New York State, the New York State Department of Health to adopt the CDC guidelines or at least the three foot element of the CDC guidelines if not everything else. New York State could come up with a different transmission metric, but right now, according to the CDC metric, this is where things stand. So that really finishes that portion of it, Mr. Fuchs. Do you want me to open it up to questions for the audience or the board? Yeah, I think that would be fine. I'm sure a number of folks here today, that's probably the primary reason that they're attending. So, so first, do any board members have any questions? Okay. So we'll open it up. Um, instead of getting up and speaking in the microphone, if you can just speak loudly, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer. Will they be able to hear it at home? No, Jeff, they're not going to be able to hear at home if you do that. Uh, why don't we help here then, Rob? Just a quick question. When it um, in the guidelines here, it talks about cohorts. Yes. What what is what is that? We'll give you an example from the middle school. In our middle school, the kids stay in the same classroom, and the teachers come to them rather than having the kids move from classroom to classroom. A cohort is essentially the same group of students for a period or multiple periods during the day. So it's always been like that at the elementary school, but in the middle school, we specifically scheduled by cohorts because that was one of the recommendations over last summer. It took a lot of time and effort. There are a couple of places in the middle school where they do not follow in cohorts. Band orchestra chorus is one, lunch is another, but they're few, and as long as we can space at six feet when they're not in a cohort, no matter what the transmission zone, the CDC guidance would allow for it if it gets adopted by New York State. So essentially, in a cohort, the teachers move, the kids stay still. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I'm speaking as a parent and a teacher. I mean, needs are great. Obviously, kudos to parents trying to teach their child at home. Um, yet, in the classroom, the needs, we need to meet, meet the kids' needs, and obviously more support, if at all, is able to be you know, addressed, that would be greatly appreciated. Understood, thank you. And I just have a question um, for my edification, I guess. So right now we're at 0.2% positivity rate, and that's considered the red zone. What is the yellow zone, and how do you get to the green zone? What are the thresholds? Um, I know the differential between the 218 number that's up there now. The differential between red and orange is 100 or below. I'm sorry, I don't know what the other two are, but they're on that particular website. And so 0.1% would get you to the orange? Yeah. Okay. Instead of doing it as a percent, they do it as a number per 100,000 residents. So that that's no what it is, though. Right, understood. Yep. If you calculate it to a percent, yep. yeah. I was going to hold this for public session, but I guess I'll speak to it now. Um, Dr. Hicks, I appreciate. I know the um, the superintendent's council sent another letter on March 12th, so I appreciate um, you banding together for that. Um, I think all of us sitting here are in agreement that transmission rates based on community is absolutely ridiculous. I understand that's not your rule, but I also know that there's states across the U.S. that have their schools opened, regardless of what the CDC says. With that stated, I know that you have sent letters before. What I would ask our board, Dr. Josh, Mary Beth, Dennis, Mike, James, Tricia, and Dawn, have any of you sent a letter individually or together as a group? Have you talked to the board associate, the Board of Education Association? Have you sent a letter in, in I with them? I have. I have as well. I would urge each of you to not only send an individual letter. Us parents sitting here have sent letters 
three, plus 365 days plus since last March, urging for our kids to be put first. I am urging each of you as elective officials of Clarence to write your letters because at this point it's no longer political. I have a um, definition here of the Board of Education and it states, a body of officials elected to, appointed to oversee a local or statewide school system or systems. The heart of that system is our kids and we have to put them first now. Enough is enough. So I'm urging you as a group to send a letter, individually to send a letter. Us parents have sent letters for months now to you and the only person that usually responds is Dr. Hicks. It is time to step up. Thank you. Question. Can I can I comment to that, Jeff? Can I make a comment to that? Sure. I would support sending a letter from the full board to the governor or to mm. um, the Erie County Department of Health and the New York State Department of Health. Dr. Zucker and Governor Cuomo. I don't know where everybody else stands, but I would definitely support that and sign that letter. Are there going to be any logistical spacing issues in the buildings if uh, the 88% of um, parents that want to send their kids back five days a week, if we assume the three foot social distancing guideline are adopted, are our buildings able to take that? Well, there's always challenges. Lunch is a challenge. Special area classes are a challenge. Um, recess, use of the playground is a challenge. Uh, but we were able to work most of those things out if we can get to three feet. At six feet, it's not possible. Um, and just one more follow-up. Um, I have a question. Is there any issue of insurance coverage that's being worried about? Gail Bernstein had mentioned that Erie 1 BOCES, Erie 2 BOCES wouldn't um, cover the district for insurance if they went against any of the, um, I believe, state um, mandates right. for guidelines. Is that something that you're concerned with? Is that a challenge that um, Yes, frankly, that is a challenge. Now, our provider is not, our insurance provider, our carrier is not Erie One BOCES. It's the New York State uh, Insurance Reciprocal, NICER. Uh, and we've checked with them. And of course, when you assume more risk as a school district, when you don't follow the New York State guidelines. So the hope that we have is that we don't have to assume any of that risk. The New York State Department of Health will um, take into account what the CDC has just done and incorporate that guidance into its guidance. That's the best way all around for school districts across New York State. And the schools that are local that have opened up um, without hitting the six foot, I believe Sweet Home um, Elementary School have been open. Are they at danger of not having insurance coverage by NYSED for doing what is, you know? Well, You'd have to go ask that particular school district that question. I don't want to speak on their behalf. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I, I would just ask, and I don't know, Josh, maybe you could chime in. Um, but I, I would ask in terms of these guidelines, it's my understanding that schools have not been shown to be a significant incubator of the COVID virus. And my question is, is who are these guidelines <clears throat> designed to protect? The, the kids, primarily? The kids and the adults. Okay. And I, as a physician myself, I work closely with Dr. Lynch over at Millard Suburban, I would just ask Dr. Lynch, how many kids are you seeing at the ER at the Graf and and suburban that you're with COVID that are really sick that you have to ship off to Children's Hospital for treatment? Yeah, I think um, those are great questions. Um, I, you know, I, I think the the CDC guidance is meant for the general public, right? And and while Looking at the percentage rates, you know, to your point about looking at how the CDC calculates, and I'm a percentage, I, I immediately calculated the percentage and, and thought to myself, that's really low uh, in, in regards to the colors, and that's not the percentages that we were used to when we were hearing the state percentages, right? But I think that taking the CDC guidelines into account are, 
it, in regards to the school district, those are guidelines. We answer to the, to the state's guide, to the state's regulations, really. So when the state issues their guidance, hopefully it's soon, hopefully it's similar to the CDC gu guidelines, it, it doesn't have to be the same and it may not be the same. So we're, we're really kind of stuck waiting for their regulations to come out. And to, to Dr. Hicks' point about insurance liability, the district takes on more insurance, more r risk by not following the state guidelines. So Dave, I, I, I don't disagree that the CDC guidelines may be very wide reaching and, and more conservative than we would like for kids in particular, given our experience and expertise in regards to transmission rate amongst the young, young children and degree of illness. Um, but unfortunately, we're, we're all talking about the school district. Right. We're stuck following the state guidelines, right. period. Completely and understood. It, I guess I would just say publicly the discouragement that I think all of us have here is we, we have guidelines implemented to protect a teacher population, which I assume is getting immunized, and to protect then a patient or student population that they're not the ones getting sick with this. Right. So I, I'll just say it's the road to hell is paved with good intentions sometimes. Thank you. Just one more, com just one, one more comment about the elementary school regulations. It, um, on the, I think that was your first or second slide, I did take note that for the elementary school, it doesn't matter, elementary school age students, it doesn't matter what the transmission rate is, the recommendations are the same. And as it gets, as the school student population gets older, i.e. middle and high school, you see the CDC guideline recommendations change. Jeff. Uh, oh. There's a strong possibility, thank you. There's a strong possibility that our high school might not be able to go back to school in the fall if we don't get out of the red zone. And I know that they're doing this, they're, they're, they're doing this purposefully to perhaps get the entire population vaccinated. I'm not really sure what the purpose is. I don't wanna speculate on that. But as we look to the fall and we look to the high school where their mental health is, is most at risk, I understand we need to get the elementary kids back every day. That's fantastic and I applaud that. But it worries me about the high school kids. It's fantastic that we're cohorting the middle. Um, but I would recommend, you know, it's also disturbing that Cuomo has not issued the state guidance yet when California has. And you know, when California is doing something first, that's a little worrisome. Um, but the fact that they haven't come out yet, I, I just wanna see a lot of advocacy, you know. And also, you know, the state guidance does say that we can go under six feet with barriers. I know we have the barriers. The barriers are optics, I get it, we don't wanna use it. But you know the guidance has been like that the whole time, that we can use, go under six feet with barriers. And I know ECDOH doesn't want to acknowledge that. Their guidance differs from the state. They're going against the state guidance. I get it. You know, it's a great big knot. But um, you know, I, I think we're all just becoming increasingly worried for our kids. So yeah. thank you. Understood. We share the worry. I had a question really quick, and I guess I'll ask it to you since you're a physician. You know, I think the flip side of the coin is, what is the anxiety rate that's going on with kids today? I feel like there's more kids who are suffering more and more from anxiety. I mean, you hear about suicides periodically, and it's so awful. I, I can't even imagine. So I'm wondering if there's any kind of consideration for the flip side of the coin of not bringing these kids back. Sure, we made arguments in the letter that we wrote through the Erie Niagara Superintendents Association about mental health. We also made the arguments about making sure that kids could get back to the connections and the academic excellence of making sure that they're in school every day. Um, all those arguments are good arguments. What we're waiting on now is the New York State Department of Health to move. There's no reason for them not to move. Uh, the CDC is, was the original purveyor of guidance way back in, uh, way back last March when this pandemic first began. As soon as they moved, most states go forward and adopt that. New York State has the capability to do that. 
It's a little slow right now, but we're hopeful that within the next two weeks they will make a decision and do so. There was a nationwide study that said it was over 90% um, increase on uh, anxiety, depression, all of the numbers were 90% um, 90 range in suicide. I do want to make one note. I heard um, Dr. Josh, you had mentioned the CDC is for the general public. Our kids are not the general public. They're not the general public. At some point, we are going to have to stand up because New York State is failing our kids, Erie County is failing our kids, and I would hate to see Clarence fail our kids. I understand you're looking for it, but the other key word is guidance. Gail came out the other day and said that we're asking her to change policies. It is not policies, it's guidance, which means we have the ability to go outside of guidance. I understand that's a hard call, I understand that, but at some point, we're gonna have to put our kids first. And I think private schools are doing that and daycare centers have been doing that. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a parent, and the reason I'm here is mental health. Um, my seven-year-old has autism, and I thought maybe I was alone with the increased meltdowns. Her saying that she doesn't know why she's alive when she's so unhappy. She misses her friends and she misses her teachers. She doesn't know that her Zoom kids are real children. She's, she needs more supports, and frankly, I'm not saying push them back to school if it's unsafe. We need more resources. Talk about happy things, not reading, not math, not numbers. These kids are traumatized. They miss their friends. Over half a million people in our country died of this. And let's think how many children lost grandparents, aunts and uncles, and beloved friends and family. Um, is there an increase in grief counseling? Is there an increase in mental health staff? Are we prioritizing um, recess, chances to interact and play? I'm not seeing it. In fact, when I tried to get my child's education blocked in chunks, I was told I signed up for remote learning, so I should have been prepared for that, as if any of this were ideal. I was kicked in the pants for saying I should have chosen in-person hybrid rather than remote. And I'm just dealing with it because that's what we have to do. But as I talked to more people about my daughter's situation, I found a whole host of parents. I talked to one, a friend of mine, who said she pulled her 15-year-old from Clarence High School because she was idealizing suicide. This is big. We cannot teach our children when they're depressed. We cannot build upon their reading skills or their math skills when they are distraught. I would like to see less focus on academics. I'm seeing all these numbers, pandemic data generalizations about students not losing their, their academic, um, I'm sorry, not regressing, but I see no data about their mental health. And this just tells me what the priority is and it's not their mental health. I, I, I agree with her. Um, my son is a third grader and I'm dealing with the same thing, um, being called effortless because he's not mentally stable or sitting behind a mask all day with a shield, um, being disciplined for not wanting to do something and losing recess during a, a pandemic. I mean, it's, it's upsetting putting these kids through what they're going through, you know, like lose, not having friends to play with. That we need some more um, emotional support here. We do. These kids are going through a lot and it's not fair. I think this will be my last question also, I'm sorry. Um, it's a two part question. Um, first, I understand to a certain probably a large degree, complete degree, we're kind of preaching to the choir with you folks because I'm, I think you all want to have the kids back as well. So I respect that. I also respect your constraints with the state, but two part question. One, what would be the ramifications if Clarence school district forged ahead on their own and said, 
we're going back to teaching our kids and we're going to bring them all back, the state guidance be damned, what would be the ramifications of that? And I apologize if that's an ignorant question, but, and I would also ask along those lines and, and, and with that previous question of insurance, what if parents signed a waiver for their children that they'll accept the risk of their children getting sick and there'd be no ramifications from a parent standpoint for that? You're actually not allowed, you can't um, waive health and safety of your child. So that wouldn't really be allowed. Um, and and uh, some of the ramifications uh, going forward are a little bit unknown, to be honest. You know, we are governed by New York State, and we do follow guidance and regulations and rules. Um, going forward, the same group of people who want all their children in every day, when something happens and we weren't following the guidance or the rules or the laws, would, I'm sure, be upset uh, again. Er ergo, that's why I'm talking about a signing a waiver. And you can't wave that out. And in terms of waiving health and well-being of our children, I think keeping them away from school, it's a bit laughable to say, you know, I, I don't mean that as insulting, but. Yeah, that's um, yeah, I would expect 100% or close to of that 88% would probably sign that waiver. Understood. The entity to push is the New York State Department of Health. They call the shots on health and safety for schools in New York State and on the whole pandemic. That's part of my question. There's public schools doing it. So it sounds like we have the support with 88% of the respondents wanting their children in full time. It sounds like we have the resources. So my question is one, maybe it's a dumb one, maybe I should know this, but why are we not doing this if other public schools are and taking that risk? Number two, have you reached out to those that are and figured out why they're able to do it and we are not? And number three, if you do get the green light, how long is it gonna take us to initiate that? Because I heard a lot about surveys and answering more questions and you know we just want them in ASAP yeah understood it can't happen overnight okay and I'll get into what we have as a kind of projected timeline in just a second but um, to answer your question there are local departments of health not Erie County who have created in essence guidance for the school districts that are within their area they've deviated from the New York State Department of Health the Erie County Department of Health has made it crystal clear that they will not do that, that they are following the guidelines of the New York State Department of Health and they won't change them. So that puts an additional risk on it. It's not proper to assume that we haven't pushed. We have pushed. Um, we've pushed every single entity that we can think of, including our legislators. What needs to happen is the New York State Department of Health needs to adopt the CDC guidelines. It's a simple thing. If they do that, the brakes are off, 
we can get the kids back definitively in the, in the elementary and the middle school, and as soon as we can in the high school, depending upon whatever the metric is. The CDC has created metrics in the past that haven't been followed by New York State. They've created guidelines in the past. The, the most recent one is uh, interscholastic athletics and high-risk sports. Erie County said yes to that. The New York State Department of Health said yes to that, uh, even though the CDC had said no. So the entity that makes the health and safety rules is the New York State Department of Health. We'll be hard pressed in Erie County to go do our own thing if we can't get the support of the New York State Department of Health. They make the guidelines for health and safety. No, I understand that, but I guess I'm just wondering, like, what is it about Clarence that doesn't want to assume that risk when other public districts in Erie County have? Like he brought up Sweet Home, Orchard Park, like wh why are they in school and we're not? Right, well, we have kids in school every day like Orchard Park and Sweet Home do. We just happen to happen, happen to have the elementaries at half days. Well, that's a huge okay. difference, I'm sorry. All right. Well, I understand, <laughs> but So that's there was just my simple question, like what is the difference? Dr. Why are we Hicks. unwilling to assume that whatever right. risk that is, and they are? Jeff, Jeff, just with regards to Sweet Home, if I recall correctly, I don't think they're, they had a number of TOSA positions. They had extra staff. And what they did is they employed those staff out of district office into the classroom to get the class sizes down so they could have the kids in more often. Okay. We just did not have that luxury to hire staff. So if you have large classrooms or very small class sizes, you can bring kids in at six feet and it's not an issue. So that, you know, one of the things that has to happen is the New York State Department of Health has to weigh in. They can say we're not going with the CDC guidance, they can say we are going with the CDC guidance, but they have to weigh in. This guidance came out on Friday afternoon. It's a couple days old. The New York State Department of Health is going to have to analyze it and make a decision. And then we'll take our lead from there and work forward. Yes. Now, does, New York State, can, thank you. does New York State still follow that yellow, red? So are we yeah. now supposed to be operating on two different definitions of yellow, right. red, orange? There's no more red anywhere in New York State. But is it, I, according to New York State's metrics, there's no right. more red. But Correct. are we still supposed to be paying attention to those New York State ones plus the CDC ones? I just don't know. Right. Are we or you don't know? The only way that we would is if we went back into the red for New York State and we had to test kids in order to open school even at six feet with a hybrid model. <laughs> you were talking Harris. about the cluster zones. Yeah, That's I'm just wondering if like we're gonna have to now deal with two different ways just, of determining. Just to clarify. You know, and and are, are we going to, well, I mean, I know there's no way to know, but would so, the New York State Department of Health be apt to scrap our system and go with the CDC system. I guess there's no way to know we for don't sure. Know yet. Just, but I as of now, we're still beholden to that original cluster zone thing. That's still a thing. No, it's not still a thing. It's it's not a thing anymore under executive order because the all of the schools or all the counties drop below that particular level. Okay, so we're not dealing with that at least now. We're just have if to there worry was a huge spike again and we got up to that level, they may bring back the cluster zones. Okay, all right, thank you. I was just gonna clarify, I think the way to look at it is the CDC came out with the guidance which has a coloring system so there's confusion. It's just, they're, they're, they're rolling out the guidance does not uh, and impact New York State until New York State adopts some guidance. So until this is a reference point, we think New York State is gonna move based on singles that we've received but we don't know until they actually make a decision. So right now, Dr. Hicks and the rest of the staff are planning for a return under what we believe to be the guidance. As we get clarity on the guidance, we'll refine those plans. Next week, the hope, if everything plays out, is we'll actually have guidance, but if not, at a minimum, the plan is to share what we hope to do, given an assumption on guidance, if some does not come out, along with the timeline. So a metric question for you. Um, the CDC's is um, new cases per 100,000 added up over a seven day period. 
rather than a rolling seven-day average, which is the state's using. My question is, the state's making all their decisions on reopening based on their rolling seven-day average, not the CDC's add seven days of new cases together, which gives you the 200 some. We're talking, you know, 25.6 per day rather than 200 some per week that way. So my question is, you know, how does that logically make sense? And then the final point would just be, if you have barriers that for all students, then you can open up, you know, at less than six feet. You, if you have the barriers, you can open up less than six feet. So you wouldn't be in, not in compliance with anyone, I believe, at that point, because the New York State Department of Health has the barrier subsect right there in the ruling. Right, that's true. However, the interpretation for Erie County, which took place last, uh, last August in consultation with the Erie County Department of Health was that it had to be six feet with or without barriers. That's the way the county has been contact tracing since. So, but you're saying that county wasn't going to do anything different than the state, but this is the county doing something different right. than what well, the state's got. In the very did. beginning, the county did things differently than the state, but recently, Dr. Burstein got on and said that she's going to follow, that she doesn't make policy, and that she is going to follow whatever New York State Department of Health is. But that would kind of be like both sides. If right. Well, she's look, free. all I'm going to say is this. It's a, there's a fluidity to the situation. The best way to make sure that we can get all the kids back is to go to three feet. That we can do. Okay. Well, I just say they're going to keep pushing off who's responsible, who's not responsible. If the rules say it can be six feet with barriers and the health department saying, hey, we're not making any new policy, right. well, that would seem to be an opening for you guys. I understand you'd like to have the liability coverage for it, but if that's what the law says and you have the barriers, you guys were great. You invested early you know, with the barriers. I mean, Williamsville wasn't able to do that. Um, I just don't know why we wouldn't take advantage of what we already purchased and to do it you know, according to the state. If the state's New, New York State Department of Health is the, mm -hmm. the person that you're responsible to. So if that's what their rules are, even currently, then you would be fine, no matter what Gail Bernstein comes out and says. Well, and you know, we're responsible to Dr. Bernstein for contact tracing and quarantining kids and adults. Okay. That's the, that's the dichotomy. That's the differential. So you're speculating on a couple of things. Look, I hope it all works out. We've been wanting it to work out for months. They just need some more pressure, but I understand. <laughs> Jeff, I hope you're right. Uh, Jeff and Mike, I'd like to just make a few comments. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I don't pretend to speak for the whole board. But we have heard and we appreciate the efforts of all parents. And somehow I think there's a misconception with some people that we're on different sides of the argument. We are not. We want these schools to open full time. I have lobbied for that and I appreciate what you've done. I also appreciate the fact that you've had rallies at the Erie County Wrath Building because the problem is not 9625 Main Street and Clarence, it's 95 Franklin Street. We need the county health department to cooperate with us with contact tracing and other things. And finally, as long as you're uh, advocating, I would suggest everyone, as soon as you're eligible, get the vaccine. Listen to the scientists, listen to the doctors, don't listen to some of these uh, you know, talk show hosts that are without any evidence. If we get everyone to vaccinate, we're going to be back to where we were a couple years ago. And I, and I can't wait for that day. So thank you for your efforts. Just one other point. On the, I, I don't know that we elaborated about the legislator meetings as much as we probably should have. But on the 12th, most of the board met with uh, Senator Rath and, and Assemblyman Norris and made it very clear a lot of articulated a lot of the arguments that a lot of you have made tonight to them to not only apply pressure to the State Department of Health leadership, but also the County Department of Health leadership. And, and again, what many of you have expressed tonight. And I think those comments were well received by both individuals. Um, and our strategy was if we can talk to them, they're, they're working in Albany, they have the ear of people who can make decisions. So that's why we took time out to try to, to meet with them on the 12th. And again, I think articulated our arguments pretty clearly. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna jump in and do part two, which is the budget. So the most recent thing that's occurred for our budget is the passage of the $1.9 trillion stimulus, which 
provides $350 billion for state and local governments and $130 billion to schools. $12.6 billion goes to New York State and an additional $9.4 billion goes to schools. Uh, there's some caveats on the money. You must use it, at least 20% of it, to address learning loss, and there's some other things on the next slide. We don't know exactly what Clarence will receive in additional aid or what strings are attached yet, but we do believe we can spend it over two, -third, two years. There were numbers that were posted in the Buffalo News, but those numbers are not necessarily official yet. So we have yet to receive from the New York State Education Department, that's another entity, how much this is actually going to be for Clarence, but we do know what it is for New York State. 20% um, of the funds need to be based on students' academic, social, and emotional needs for next year. And the things that you had saw in the presentation are recommendations for next year, okay? So the remaining funds can be used for any of the things that are on here. And those are things that we also use our general funds for. So we're hopeful that we will get additional dollars. And if we do, we have some recommendations for the board. Unfortunately, we can't wrap the whole budget up tonight because we don't know what those dollars are going to be yet. But we will know by April 16th when the board needs to vote. So there's a couple of concerns out there. One of them is if we get federal money or the federal money backstops cuts in state money, and the federal money does not recur year over year, then we end up being at a fiscal cliff at some point uh, where we need to raise a lot of money in New York State to supplement what's been coming from the federal government. So the use of these funds over multiple years is critical to make sure that we're not in a place where we have to do large layoffs or any type of large tax increase in the future. Uh, another really big item for New York State is New York City's economic recovery. So New York City accounts for well over 50% of the state's growth and in income, and it has to make a comeback in order for the New York State budget to have enough dollars. Third, there's a Supreme, New York State Supreme Court case right now that challenges taxing, in, taxing the income of workers who work remotely outside of New York State. They don't live in New York State, but they pay New York State income taxes. It's a large chunk. It accounts for about 16% of all income tax receipts, which is more than all of upstate. If that court decision goes the wrong way, the state's going to be in another large financial hole. So those are some longer term things. The way the budget process works is the governor puts out a budget in January. He did that. We built our first budget based on the governor's numbers. The governor had cuts in the budget for schools, but he backfilled it with money from the first stimulus package that came out in December. Next, the Senate and the Assembly come out with their budgets. These are the things that happened in the one house budgets that are different than what the governor had. Um, number one, school aid would be increased to in total, larger than what the governor said. Number two, the star money would not be taken away from school districts. That's a huge thing. Number three, we would not, the, both the Senate and the Assembly were against consolidating expense-based aids into something called services aid. That's another big thing. Every one of these things, if they don't happen, could flow additional dollars to places like Clarence. Third, foundation aid actually increased in the one house budgets where it was frozen under the governor. Uh, there's a chance to increase universal pre-K in the budget that wasn't in the governor's proposal. The House, or I'm sorry, the Assembly and the Senate rejected the governor not paying for special education re um, residential costs. And there's a provision for the Senate and the Assembly budget to have dig digital equity in those areas where people don't have internet service that works well. So this is a lot of stuff. Uh, if even some of it makes it into the final budget, it could be very good news for Clarence and it could be good news for the kinds of programs that we know we have to put in place next year, hoping that we're back to normal uh, this year, but definitely in September. Uh, the Senate wants a property tax circuit breaker. Uh, there's some other things about freezing school aid calculations and a sales tax increase on the wealthiest New Yorkers. So. Uh, we 
are going to anticipate that we're receiving additional funds. We had already balanced our budget with the previous funds. We are going to make some recommendations to the Board of Education about what they should do with those additional funds. And this data backs that up. So at our high school, the percentage of kids that failed one or more classes over the first two marking periods was about 5% higher this year than the previous two years. Not dramatic, but what you'd expect. The percentage of kids who failed one course was about equivalent to the last two years. The percentage of kids at the high school who, who failed two courses was about 5% higher. The number of referrals to our Family Support Center was about the same as previous years, but the presenting issues for those referrals have increased. And all of this would be something that's logical that you would think because kids haven't been back in school for a year during the pandemic. But this is the kind of data that we give to the board when we make recommendations for increases in the number of teachers or programs. At the middle school, it's about the same. About 7% higher on kids failing one or more courses. Kids failing just one course is about equivalent to the last couple of years. Kids failing two or more courses, about 6% higher than the previous two years. Jeff, can I just make a comment? Sure. Like, when you say like 5% higher than two years, and 7% higher, those numbers don't really look like all that much. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're looking at like CMS is about 6% higher than the two previous years. Like if you look at the chart, that's like 105 more percent when you're really looking numbers. Like 55 last year to whatever, 100 and some. So the, this number 6% is really kind of deceiving because really it's 105% more are failing two classes, correct? Well. 6% higher than the previous two years. Failing but if you two take the more. 55 that were failing two last year and you go to 100, I don't have the numbers, for, 109. Wouldn't that be 105% higher? It was 5% last year, it's now 11% this year. That's the right. plus. If you, if you mean where you're starting as a example. base the previous year. Right, because if you're taking kids to kids, I mean, that number, when you look at 105% more, is that's crazy. I mean, that proves the point that kids need to be in school here. I, I mean, I just, I feel like the 6% is kind of deceiving on the... Right. Well, there was a baseline already on failures. This particular school year, that was off for failing three or more courses in the middle school and high school. Yes. At the elementary level, uh, we, pr we use a assessment called STAR. Students demonstrated similar growth pre-pandemic and throughout the pandemic in reading except for sixth grade, and the same was true when we looked at low-income students. So that was a surprise. We expected that to be lower, or to have the reading levels lower, but they were not. For uh, math, they were about the same for grade three and four students, but they grew less in grades five, six, and seven, and the gaps were slightly larger for low-income and students with disabilities as well. Uh, when the kids were reassessed this winter in reading and math, most grade levels resumed the pre-pandemic growth uh, metric that we had established as a baseline, and that was good news. Kids with disabilities did not exhibit more extreme academic losses than general education kids. And in math, uh, low-income kids exhibited slightly larger academic losses in fifth and sixth grade. So. We don't know exactly how much money is going to flow towards the school district as a result of the budget negotiations and the $1.9 trillion stimulus. But we would put these elements as the things that we would like the board to consider. We'd like to be able to do all of them. Doing all of them would be very expensive and we would have to get a bunch of money in order to do so. But we need more psychologists in the district. Uh, and we would be recommending more. We, meet, we need another social worker at our family support center, and we would be recommending that. Um, LAC is the place in the middle school and the high school where kids go for extra help and when they, need, uh, when they need a teacher to work with them individually. So we need additional teachers in those LACs at the middle school and the high school. They're highly used places. Uh, we need another grade six teacher for interventions at grade six. Uh, we also need math intervention teachers at all four of the elementary schools and additional reading specialists at the middle, at the elementary schools. Uh, a special education teacher 
And we would propose a summer school program at all three levels. Elementary for the first time in 10 years, middle school and high school as well. And the summer program would not necessarily be makeup work, but could be enrichment as well. Project-based. Project-based. Yes. We'd also recommend that we reduce the appropriated fund balance to zero, um, providing a hedge for future budgets, at least a three-year hedge for future budgets. So we've reviewed some of this with the Board of Ed. We're providing it for the community. If we get extra money, this is where we'd like, this is where we would recommend that it be spent, mostly on intervention and mental health needs across the district. Jeff, would that be a one-year or a two-year fix, or would it be keeping these people indefinitely? Uh, we wouldn't want to hire anyone that we would have to lay off a year later, Don. So um, if we can spend the money over multiple years, getting positions back over multiple years, depending upon what the 22-23 budget looks like, is would be the prudent, responsible, fiscal thing to do. If, um if we get, well, when we get clarity uh, as New York State adopts the budget, <clears throat> hopefully in advance of our next meeting and we can act on this list or some variation therein, knowing that we will, <clears throat> we're gonna move in that direction. Is there any opportunity to potentially get some of these positions onboarded before the end of the year to start to help with that support? Uh, probably not, go ahead, Rick. Uh you know, certainly, uh, when you say before the end of the school year, um, there's there's very little bit of time left. Um, if if positions were posted now and everything was done, you you might be able to appoint somebody in June. So fair enough. I think one couple things. Obviously, we have a need, as the data right. shows, and this is something we're looking to do in the future as we have funding clarity to support it. But if if we are able to swing it, doing it sooner obviously is beneficial. The other thing, if every district is, is going to get the same, I'll just call it a windfall, that was certainly unexpected four months ago. I mean, this is night and day from four months ago. They're all going to be hiring for people as well. Right. So how do we get in front of it? So what we do, Mr. Fuchs, is as soon as the board approved the budget, we'd post the positions. Now, normally, they would be positions for the next school year because, remember, we're still in the 2021 budget year and the expenses for this year, even though some of them have been less and some have been more resulting in the pandemic, we're still working off those total dollars. But as soon as the board would approve in April, then even before the guilt gets to the community vote, we would post for the positions and we wouldn't make it official until the community vote made the budget of tax rate that we publish with the April budget is always less than when it actually is when it's set in August. Uh, unfortunately, we discovered late last week that the town of Clarence is reassessing properties. Um, this rate is bound to go even lower than what we have up here from last year as a result of that reassessment. So even though people's assessed value of their homes are likely to go up, the tax rate as a result of that is likely to go down even to uh, cover the levy that we have. So these are estimates and these are, these are high estimates. It's almost, it's almost assuredly gonna be less than this by the time it all fleshes out when the reassessment is done in Clarence. But about $27 for every $100,000 on your house, or about $108 for a $400,000 house, about $54 for a $200,000 house. And again, we would expect this to be much less, correct, Rick? Correct. Okay maybe even half of what's up there. We are required by law to provide to the Board of Education and the community a three-part budget that lists administration, capital, and program separately. So that's what these two particular slides are about. These numbers will change depending upon dollars that flow from the federal government to the school district. And the percentages will probably stay just about the same. Also, uh, every year at this time, we give the board a five-year projection of the budget. So 2021 is the base year, and then you can see the next five years of projections, and you can see uh, what wages and benefits and debt service and BOCES is. That also goes with the next five years worth of what we're projecting revenues to be. So uh, we are also 
uh, asking the community to support a bus purchase plan for this year. We're on a 10 to 12 year replacement cycle. Uh, this year we would ask the community to fund uh, eight different buses, four of the 72 passenger buses that don't have compartments in them, two of the 72 passenger buses that have those big compartments that you can put musical instruments and sports stuff in, uh, and two 30 passenger vans. Uh, we could trade in our old buses for about 11 grand, so it would be a little over $900,000 on this. Because we've been doing this every year, it would just replace the debt that's coming off from the last five-year cycle, so it wouldn't have an impact on the tax levy this year. Uh, these are the budget meetings that we've had. The next budget meeting is April 12th. That's the day that the board would have to adopt the budget. If things aren't entirely clear, we'll have to call a special meeting later in the month. Uh, I don't think we can go past around April 20th, someplace in there, okay? But by that time, the state will either have a budget or it won't have one and we'll have to guess, okay? May 10th is the budget hearing, which is really perfunctory. Everyone already knows everything by the time that date rolls around. And May 18th is the public budget vote. We are voting in person, as far as we know. There's been no other regulations from the Department of Health on that. We'll vote in the gym like we always do, and people can get an absentee ballot if uh, COVID is a reason they don't want to come into the school to vote. They can get an absentee ballot. You can go to our website and download the form. So that concludes the budget report. Mr. Fuchs, if the board has any questions or if you want me to open it up to the community. <clears throat> Does the board have any questions? I'm good at this time. Okay. Open it up. Any budget questions, community members? Sleech. But budget specifically for now, if you want to, we'll, we'll go to public comment in a second. Okay, okay, so that concludes the budget. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. Uh, with that, public comment, sir. Amy Leach, uh, my address is 8953 Amy Lee Lane. Um, first, I'm wearing black and white tonight, or black and red tonight, for all of our seniors, one of which I do not have one of, but I feel everyone who does. For our kids who are struggling, the kids that are too fearful to go back to school, because that's a reality, and for all the kids wanting to go back to school. Again, I would just urge you, board, like I had said earlier, to make your statements, to please reach out to not only the legislators, because as we know, they're not the ones who are making the decisions in New York State, but I urge you to reach out to the New York State DOH, the Erie County DOH, um, Mr. Bernstein, and uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Bernstein, and uh, Mr. Polenkers. I would like to reiterate um, that there is a huge need for mental health. If there's anything the district is able to do before the increase in budget or the federal funding, I would urge you to do that. We have students in our district that I know you've, you've been notified about who are struggling. They're struggling mentally, physically, and emotionally. And this has to be dealt with. These poor kids, and I have one of my own, are struggling with grades, grades that were never an issue. And I do want to I do want to reiterate something that there's districts in Erie County that are being a little more lenient than some of our teachers are. And that is a huge concern because kids are ha having anxiety over grades. Yeah. Yeah. It, it needs to end. Yeah. I have the same problem that I've had with several teachers about not being accommodating with late work, with grades, with little things that are wrong with their work. These kids are doing everything they can. The parents are doing everything they can. This is the first year I've actually been asked to be a parent advocate at an IEP meeting. Things have to change. My, my kids are suffering because I spend more time with other parents, not even in this district, than I do with my own children. That's because I believe in all the kids, not just mine. It is a big issue and it has to be dealt with. Um, secondly, I appreciate that um, there was mention in the budget of the loss of learning funds. Um, Chris and I appreciate that um, summer school, when I did see the summer school, it, did, it was alarming to me a little bit because I think the kids need, if there is summer school, project-based learning is a great way to do that. I wish that that was the implementation for this entire year this year because testing is creating anxiety. Um, 
Kids are struggling because they notice that remote kids get to take their tests at home and there is cheating still, I, it, it happens. Kids that go to school to take their tests are having anxiety over it and I just, I wanna make mention of that. So um, I am worried about kids having to be in summer school all summer. Um, I'm worried about the avenue that they'll um, have in school. Will they be behind barriers? Will they be on their Chromebooks? I think that if there is summer school that has to be creative, that I don't know if you can focus group kids, if it's not a full, full day for them, if there, there has to be creative ways to do this because our kids need a break. Like as much as my kid, there's been a loss of learning, there, there also needs to be a discovery of a break. Um, additionally, I would ask, I didn't see it in there, but um, extra one-on-one -on -one tutoring um, for next year because I think the education gap is going to be lasting. It's not gonna be a fix overnight. So I don't know if there's a way to give extra one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Many parents can't afford it. Um, I don't know if there's a way to deal with that. Um, also, um, I know we have co-taught co -co teachers for 504 and IEP rooms or um, co-taught classrooms. I'm wondering if there's an ability to make more of those classrooms next year, whether the need is in math, the need is in English, whatever the need is, if we could um, have extra co-taught teaching rooms um, next year, if that's a possibility. I'm just asking the district to think out of the box with where those loss of learning funds are going. Um, additionally, I appreciate the performance reports that you provided about the failures, but I think it's important, and I would ask the board to ask Dr. Hicks and administration um, for the performance reports for not only failures, but just year over year grade decreases, because I think that, they're, that just looking at the failures is the wrong way to look at it. I think there's other performance metrics that we need to look at. Um, so again, I urge the board to please advocate for our kids. I've never seen one of you at one of our rallies. I know that Lewport Students First, and I'm speaking for Students First now, had a meeting just like we did with Dr. Hicks, but their board president showed up to the meeting. I'm asking you to be involved. Because you are with our group, or because you stand with us, I don't think that's negative light. We are all parents now standing for our kids, and we're asking you to do the same as elective officials. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have a comment at this time? There's one session a little bit later on as well. Is there any online? Uh, the first, they're both from Chris Brophy. The first one was answered. Will the Family Support Center be opened over the summer for families needing assistance? I think Ms. Snyder and Dr. Hicks answered that question previous to the question session. Uh, the second comment is just that Mrs. Brophy is confused. There are two metrics that are being shown on the CDC website. She did share a table with me that I'll share with you after the meeting. Uh, one shows a factor of the total new cases that shows us in the red. And then there's another one that talks about the percentage of NAATS, and that shows us in the blue. So it's just confusing information that's out there at this time. Just to clarify, you'll share that with the board so we have that as reference? Yes. Thank you. Um, we'll move on again. There's one more comment session a little bit later. Uh, finances, Mr. Mancuso. Sure. Uh, First item that we have is the January financial reports. Uh, there's really not too much there. We did receive our STAR funds and the delinquent tax payments. Um, and we have been getting all the 20% back payments that were originally withheld from grants and the various uh, components of state aid. The next item that we have is a uh, transfer for the district treasurer or the central treasurer at the high school. Uh, later in the agenda, uh, Mrs. Bella Bennett will move to another position and we're asking you to appoint uh, Alexandria Valenti to the central treasurer position at the high school. So uh, that is an annual appointment at the reorganization meeting, uh, but there's a lot of banking paperwork that we would get ready in advance to make that switch. Uh, next item is the uh, annual budget hearing. There is a, a typo there in the first paragraph. It says March 22nd, today's date. That's really May 10th. May 10th is the budget hearing. Uh, and May 18th, as you know, is the budget vote. 
So this is a notice of the two Board of Education seats that are up for election. This is notice of that budget hearing date and the budget vote date. It is also notice that the Board of Education uh, would like to put up a proposition to buy the buses as Dr. Hicks mentioned earlier. Uh, those buses, again, it's a uh, permissive uh, resol or a permissive vote so that the board at any time between now and then, if they so desire, could remove it or then after do have to fund it finally. So that would be the last time to um, accept the buses or not. I think that's it. Is there any questions on the financials? Uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve items F1 to F4. A motion, do I have a second? Second. Second, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, personnel, instructional? Thank you, Mr. Fuchs. We start our section of this agenda with something that's bittersweet. Uh, seven of our teachers have announced their retirements. Uh, Mr. Frank Canty, CHS Science, 28 years of service. Ms. Vincenza Abel, CHS Science, 31 years of service. Ms. Mary Geshwender, CHS Special Education, 29 years of service. Ms. Sally Harris, Elementary Grade 3, 32 years of service. Ms. Noreen Rosenthal, uh, CMS Art, 23 years of service. Ms. To Leslie Tobia, CHS Foreign Language, 25 years of service. And Ms. Susan Vole, CMS Social Studies, 29 years of service. We thank all of our teachers so much for their service to our school district and wish them well. P2 has a request for an extension of an unpaid leave of absence. Appointments this month, we have two activity advisors, one unpaid coach for girls modified volleyball, one mentor for a long-term sub, and a list of teachers that are participating in the multi-tiered system of support training. P4 is a notification of tenure. This is information only. It'll be acted on next month. Uh, P5 are salary adjustments for teachers who have completed additional coursework. P6 is the spring curriculum projects from Mrs. Overholt. P7 is the, the additions to our instructional substitute list. And finally, P8 is the resolution to accept the negotiated agreement with the CTA. Thank you, Mr. Michelle. Does anybody have any questions on the instructional items? Uh, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve P1 uh, through P8, including uh, recognizing those seven teacher retirements totaling 177 years of service to the district. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Carries. Non instructional? We begin with also retirements on the non instructional side. Uh, Mr. Carl Carruthers, bus driver, 15 years of service to the district. Ms. Christina. Christina Frost, teacher aide, 23 years of service to the district. And Ms. Robin Teal, teacher aide, 25 years of service to Clarence District. Thank you to them as well for all of their years of service. And then one additional resignation. P10 are changes in hours based on student needs. Most of these are supporting our unified bowling team. Uh, P11 is a request for a leave of absence, followed by a request for an extension of a leave of absence. P13 has our appointments for this month. There are three teacher aid positions and four clerical positions. Uh, P14 are just informational items. These are cleaning positions that are transfers around the, uh, around the district. Thank you. Is there any questions on uh, non-instructional? Okay. Uh, similarly, I'd entertain a motion to approve P9 to P14, including, uh, again, the recognition of those retiring <laughs> with a collective 63 years of service to the district. Do I get a motion? Make a motion. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It carries. All right. Dr. Hicks, uh, special need and student activities? Yes, uh, 27 committee on special ed meetings last month. Uh, these are out of district kids for their annual review. Uh, only a handful of preschool and now the big push for the end of the year between now uh, and the end of the year for annual reviews is on. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on items S1 and S2? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve? Can I make a motion, Mike? Thank you. Do I have a second? Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
carries. Uh, board development, we have two items. Do you want to introduce them? Uh, first item is a policy change to fit with New York State law on uh, gender specific bathrooms. Uh, if there's a bathroom that could be, was a single, a single use bathroom, it now has to be designated as uh, gender neutral. There aren't many across the district, but there are some. So I know this is our second read. We had it introduced last month, and <clears throat> we had begun the process of labeling all those already as it is law. Are we done with that process? Uh, we're not quite done, but almost. Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion on item B1? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve policy 5633? I move. Motion, second. second. All those in favor? Uh, it carries. Do you want to talk about the school calendar? Right. On the calendar, um, our, our calendar reverts to 188 days for next year. Um, we've had some correspondence from parents on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, we're making the recommendation that we use one of the superintendent conference days on September 7th, have kids come back in on September 8th, and uh, that will take care of the Jewish high holiday. So I think we're all good with that as a board. Any questions or comments? Can I get a motion to approve? Motion. A motion, do I have a second? Second, all those in favor? Aye, calendar's adopted. All right, uh, we have a second public comment session. If anybody has any additional comments at this time? If you have any comments, if you could approach the microphone, please. Just. State your name and address for the record, thank you. Sure, my name is Bo Sunshine, 9195 Hillview Drive. Um, I just wanted to, I saw a, a letter from Gail Bernstein. She was responding to a, a parent that's here today asking about the uh, six foot width, um, the barrier um, regulation. And her statement was that our department does not establish state guidance ECDOH follows state guidance and supports schools in following state guidance. So, as I said, with New York State saying it's six feet or a barrier, if you have a barrier, it doesn't have to be six feet, and the um, Erie County Department of Health Commissioner saying she doesn't make the guidance that the state does, it would seem like they're kind of passing it back and forth. Either she has the authority to do that or she doesn't. So. Thank you for sharing that with us. Anybody else have any other com comments? Okay. Uh, in our packet, we have a schedule of upcoming meetings as Dr. Hicks alluded to in his presentation. Our next meeting will be scheduled for April 12th. It'll begin at seven o'clock in the lecture hall here at the high school. At such time, uh, we will be adopting the budget, uh, presuming uh, the state uh, moves along to schedule uh, at that time. So that'll be April 12th. Unless anybody else has any comments, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session for discussions of legal matters. I make a motion. motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone.